Um, basically, if you just look at our, our department budget, if you look at the revenue uh, section, you'll see that that's revenue that we know we're going to get, but that always increases each year due to grants that we get. But those that revenue is always offset by appropriations, so it has no effect on the budget. I mean, if you look at the rest of it, I mean, it's a pretty bare bones budget. Ken, year over year changes are 26,000 increase, just normal run of the mill increases yeah the, the personnel stuff that's all contractual yeah yep that's all i have I made reduced uh, professional services for four, from 40,000 to 25,000 uh, miscellaneous sporting services reduced that to zero took out the contribution to tourism for 30,000 pretty simple the everything that's in the Salaries is contractual. Exec, yes. just can you explain why those moves were made? Well, we wanted to be conservative about our spending and reduce those to be more conservative. But I mean, I, I'm sure that that was the bottom line. But mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the rationale. You know. The, I'm, I'm going to ask this type of question about these things that are changes in each of, each of the budgets. So, why were you able to reduce miscellaneous supporting services twenty thousand, and where did the tourism money go if eliminated well, if, from if your you, budget? If you, if you look at, <clears throat> for instance, professional services, if you go back to twenty twenty three, they're nineteen thousand nine hundred seventy three. Twenty four were forty thousand dollars. And that uh, was an extraordinary year with some expenses. Uh, okay. Same thing with mis miscellaneous supporting services, yep. and you can see that goes all over the place from almost nine hundred thousand to twenty thousand five hundred, and the county contribution to tourism we're picking up with things like bed tax. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, with the tourism, do we have to appropriate a certain amount in order for us to get the matching funds from? That was the... Want me to answer that? Sure. Okay. So, yes. 50, in the budget, I think it's like 43,808, there's a line. Yep. But last year, we received 53,808, mm -hmm. so that's what I'm anticipating this year. So, um, so we have that in there, the 53,808. That total will come out of the $150,000 of the bed tax money that we were given. So that match is deducted from that number. Okay. And we removed the $30,000 because we're not contracting with uh, the chamber. The chamber. Yeah, what is I think it was just a cost savings. Any other questions? <coughs> All right. What's over? Huh? Martin. Um, because we didn't know at the time. I love New York money is only in the budget for 48.9. Yeah. Uh, the revenue and appropriation should be an increase to the yeah. 53 in the correct resolution. 53 even? 808. Any other? Uh, all right. Uh, Sean, take the high seat. Maria didn't make a cheat sheet. Right. Oh, you did? Oh. <laughs> um, 
Okay, I just want to make you aware because you'll see a resolution. I've been trying to keep it as conservative as, as possible. If you go to page side, uh, page five, the community college tuition, um, what that is, it's the billings from the community colleges outside of FMCC. Um, if you see 23, we were short. In 24, we're going to be short again. That's, that's a total number issue. It depends on how many students go to community colleges outside of FMC. Anybody holding back on you? Because I huh? remember when I was on the college board, sometimes like co other colleges wouldn't pay. No, this is we pay them. Okay. This is where we okay. pay them All for right. Right. Their, their students. And likewise, um, yeah. Like I said, this year I'm, I'm probably close. To, I'm still getting the final bills in. I'm going to be close to probably 100000 short. And like I said, that's totally a number game of how many students attend community colleges outside of FMCC. Throughout New York State. Yes. And those rates, the, the, the chargeback rates that the colleges get change every year. So, yeah. Um, just so you're aware, our, our big three billings come from Herkimer, Schenectady. Hudson Valley. And Hudson Valley. Yeah. But it's a killer that they're, that these people from this community yes. are leaving this community to go to those places to go to school and not going up there. I mean, some, something's, something's wrong with the picture. Sometimes, Bob, it's a matter of program. Yes. You want to go to culinary, you go to Schenectady. You know, some of them have niches that they want to go to, uh, so you know, but with that shortfall yeah. this year. not a total failure on so the college's part. Yeah, really Sometimes it's... So then do we have to... <clears throat> well, that's, that's up to you if you want to be a little more conservative or if you want to hope for the best. It's up to you guys what that's going to be a decision what you guys want to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, um, as you can see, um, we did increase sales tax uh, 1.5 over the 20, the adopted 24. Um, we are gonna, we are, uh, we have exceeded, we are exceeding last year's total amount, but just a cautionary, this last quarter that we'll be distributing next month actually was down compared to the same quarter last year by about a half a percent. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it recovers, but I'm, I'm thinking we're starting to see the sales tax level out to, uh, you're not going to see the growth that you've, we've seen the last couple of years. Actually, the last two years, it's kind yeah. of leveled out, including this one. Sean, what uh, the casino revenue? Just a trend? Um, Seventy-five the, uh, increase. Like I said, we're getting around seventy-five thousand to eighty a quarter. We get that paid quarterly from. That's our distribution from the rivers. Um, but why we, do you think it's going to increase another seventy-five? Is it trending up? Um, like I said, our, our quarterly. Uh, payments have been about 75 so that's why I'm saying we should be for four quarters should be about 300 and the solid waste just started increasing. solid waste uh, we just passed a, or moved a resolution yes the other night to increase the tipping fee. yes so then that's to and make the everything budget, adopted budget of 24 doesn't include any adjustments that we've made for the year so 23 it was over 400,000 yeah so. yeah okay um now are we budgeting that we're selling any properties this year? In the, in my, well, are you looking for the, the auction properties? Mm -hmm. We no longer can profit on any property sold in an auction. That's a change in the state law based on the federal ruling um, out of Minnesota where any properties you sell in excess of the, without any taxes has and to be cost. put in, huh? And our costs or just taxes on Get so like, like our recording fees and all that. We get like $250 a property. We get $250 admin fee. Very, very nice. So <laughs> any, anything over those, we has to be put into a trust and those people have the opportunity, the previous owner has the opportunity to file it with the court to get any overage. And then does that overage, if they don't apply for it, go to unclaimed funds then? Or are we able um, to? I believe there's a, it's either three to five years after if it's not claimed, then it, um, right now the writing the law is it does revert back to the counties. But we also pick up the past due, past due taxes. Well, correct? we, well, and yeah. the tax 
relays well, that were picked up for the school tax. Oh well, yeah, like I said, that's all part of the, the outstanding taxes at time of law. So is that with the sale of real property line? No, that two seventy five and I believe a lot could probably better explain. That is the exit twenty nine property. Good job. Um, with the IDA. And I, I believe Bob could probably better explain. So that's gonna hit next year. That's gonna hit next year. Yeah, actually, the sale will be five fifty, but we have to split that with with uh, EPA. EPA, yeah. Any other questions? I have a question, Sean. What money are we getting in? We're paying out to, to community college for our students going to those. What money do we get in? What's that? Do what we money get do money we get in? in? Yeah. From from them, the only thing we get back from FMCC is a capital chargeback of about fifty. Uh, Forty thousand. Yes, the capital chargeback. That we, that's the only money we get back, and that comes from FM. We get no other money back from anybody else. All right, so we're paying tuitions for other we students, pay but tuition. we don't get anything back if, no. if, our, if their students come to, to FM. No. Yeah. We don't pay yeah. F. We pay FM a yearly contribution. Yeah. Right. It, but so we don't pay per student. If student goes to FM, right. Montgomery County's paying FM. Yes. They pay FM directly. Okay. They don't pay the counties. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. I'm just wondering where, yeah. where those relevies and, and come back into here. Just, that's part of that's part of the it'll be part of the actual the levy the levy. That just getting that. I've just missed it. would be that's it's okay. it's part of this overall number. Thanks. Page thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so <clears throat> I worked with the county executive to, after I submitted my initial budget, to cut a little bit more. Initially, it was up about $4,000 from last year. And I'm not including the money that was put in the budget for the consultants, that $300,000, because that wasn't part of my initial request last year that was put in after the fact. So all of my numbers are not including that. Um, <clears throat> so after working with the executive, we went through and we were able to cut another $45,000. And that mostly came out of computer equipment and professional services. We bought a lot of equipment the last two years, and we were preparing for losing our longtime network admin. So we purchased a lot of network equipment, a lot of PCs, a lot of um, data recovery services. We talked about all this stuff last year. So with all that equipment purchased, we're just about finished deploying all the new Windows 11 machines, all the switches are, have been deployed, all the background network stuff. Um, we're looking pretty good. So that's how I was able to cut so much from computer equipment. So overall it's about, so we're down about $45,000 in the, in the regular non-staff lines. The other big change is in the print shop. Um, we are, our long time, full time uh, print composer is retiring and we've decided to change that from a full, to reduce that from a full time to a part time position. Um, he was out a lot this year. We were able to still get most of the work done. We tra cross trained a lot of my staff to handle the non graphic things like raffle tickets and stuff like that. So the plan is we actually put two part-time positions into the budget for next year, but we fully funded one of them and half funded the other. So the plan there is to bring the full-timer back as needed to train just for next year. And after that, it'll just be one part-time position going forward. So there's a little bit of money saved there from, you know, it should be a, about a $30,000 salary savings and fringe and all the rest of that and those are the big changes um, any questions so far 
have a question. Yeah. Uh, you have no overtime budgeted for 2024, and then you have 15,000 this year. Yeah. So traditionally, we always budget around 15,000. Um, last year, we put in for 15,000, and it was taken out by the legislature. Uh, right now, we're we're going negative because you know the work needs to be done. So you know that's you know that that could be a different discussion if 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 we don't want any overtime that's that's one thing but there's a lot of work that needs to be done after hours on the weekend when we can't do the stuff when people are on their computers um, things like live streaming we talked about flexing that time but we just don't have enough staff to have somebody work okay. late and then you know not come in for half the day okay so that's you know, we're spending less overtime this year, but it's still, you know, it's we Is it still around need that fifteen thousand mark. Yeah. Okay. It's not quite there yet, but okay, it'll yeah. be close. How's the department running without this, these consultants gone now? I mean, is it is it? It's great. We, you know, it, it was such a bumpy road for the first six months of the consultants. We had a very successful last three to four months when we kind of whittled it down to just the one person that we really needed. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of training with that person and his expert expertise was in Office 365 in the cloud and, and the mi data migration. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that we've got me and one other person that trained really closely with him. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've only got a, a couple departments left. We literally have, we're DPW, is going this week economic development will probably be next week and then we come over here and do the county clerk and pat and we're done Good. so it's been pretty smooth <coughs> thank you any other questions uh the equipment rental lease so last year you budgeted like 148 now we're down to 118 we'll call it mm -hmm. Something come off in the lease, or did you negotiate a different? Or? Well, let me just double check that. Lease. Okay, so we we've been saving money every year on the um, i series because we purchased the i series instead of uh, leasing it. It still comes out of this line for our maintenance agreement. So that maintenance agreement keeps coming down a little bit. So that's about. Five thousand dollars that was reduced. We changed direction a little bit with um, how we were doing firewalls. So we budgeted twenty thousand dollars less um, for firewall equipment because we have let this year we completed um, connecting every building with dark fiber. So we don't need to put an actual firewall in every building so that's they're all coming back to the annex building and then going out from there so we're saving some money with the firewall um, and then last year we had some additional uh, UPS equipment for Venner Road and for DPW building so there was kind of like some one-off equipment just for those new buildings I think that's most of it so that number is actual contracts that you have? Yes. There's no. no, there's nothing else. No. Any other questions? Are the phones all working? We all have one phone on our desk? No. The phone, the last, uh, no. the last building is the, this building and the courthouse, the new courthouse. Everything, everyone else is done. Every, this is all going to be done by the end of the year. I'm hoping by the end of next month. It's going pretty smooth now. <laughs> Dan, uh, the network technician, I think it is a network engineer. Is that something we've already hired or is that a new position that you put in? Uh, no, that's, oh, sorry. Yeah, there is one upgrade from um, the, the micro computer tech that we've had that has been uh, working way above his pay grade and helping us handle the phones and the computer deployments. We're upgrading him from a uh, microcomputer technician to a network engineer one. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's a 
four or five thousand dollar is it a nine yeah nine thousand dollar increase trying to keep the 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 talent any other questions all right just this thank you for somebody else asked. <laughs> Thank you. I um, give you all a packet as I usually do in regards to um, the budgets. I'm not going to go page by page because you know that, you know most of it. Um, I will touch on some things that I think that you may want to hear and um, then we can go from there. So as you can see, the salary lines have increased to reflect the contractual increases, um, which is inclusive of the second half of the salary reallocation study that was approved last year. Um, you'll also see um, a labor relations, uh, labor relations assistant in this year's budget. Uh, I would add that that position was established, it was already in the executive's budget last year uh, and years prior. And in the beginning of last year, Resolution 10 of 24 moved that position into personnel. Um, so after working with the position uh, this year, um, I hired somebody and then in a, a around January, uh, July, uh, that position, that person did not work out. Uh, and because it was close to budget season, and I knew at that point after the person had vacated the position that I could lessen the position a little bit. It's still absolutely necessary, um, but I could reduce the position to the tune of around $6,000 is what uh, you don't see it in your budget. You're seeing it as a new position, um, but from where the resolution was, where the salary was scheduled to go for 2025 and to where um, I'm requesting it at is a $6,000 savings. So um, because it was budget season when that person vacated the position, and I knew I was going to request something different. I couldn't then uh, post for the position or try to hire for the position because I hadn't had your authority yet to, to, uh, to change the title. Uh, so I've been um, taking on the task and the responsibility of that position since. Okay. I would also note that the payroll lines in personnel are split between the A fund, the, the M fund, which is our health insurance fund, and then our workers' compensation fund. Um, and the reason why I tell you that is that because uh, when they're split in the M fund and the MS fund, uh, they're partially reimbursed. Okay. Um, so in regards to the payroll lines, do you have any questions? All right. I do have a question on that slide. Oh, on this slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there a number that we're projecting that comes to maybe two weeks or maybe coming in there? Um, are we close to finishing that negotiation? We are going to have our first meeting um, in, in around November. I believe we're working on dates right now to try to get to the table. I think that um, likely we're closer, uh, but you never know. So I wouldn't really be able to give you a fair projection, nor would I be able to budget for it. And then moving down, your slides will show a detail on each one of the lines, but there's, there's not that much change uh, year over year for those lines. Um, whether it's the, you'll see property lease repair line is completely eliminated. That, that was for the project 111 and 214. Um, my, per, my professional service and maintenance agreement lines are pretty consistent and they are contractual um, within in the department. It's really for our labor attorneys, our countywide door projects, civil service software, um, HR software, 
and um, necessary uh, changes in uh, from the AS400 uh, onto uh, a different platform for for HR. Nicole? Yes. I mean, before the meeting, we were talking about the million four increase estimate in health dental vision. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you did show how it trended up, you know, trended down in COVID years, trended back up. Last year at about nine million. This year, two, two, the first two quarters. If it remains the same, you know, you're going to be at about eight, 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 nine again. Um, Just for the A fund. Yeah. Yep. Um, the million four, do you think, I mean, I, I guess I asked you this earlier, but it seems, you know, it's to be a sizable increase. Do you think it's going to trend? It looks like it's trending up to about nine million again this year. It could be even higher. It could. Mm -hmm. uh, is that based on what you know has happened in the third quarter that we don't see yet here on this number? I know it based on how the market is trending. Uh, uh -huh. Costs everywhere are going up. Uh, surgical procedures, pr procedures in general, are um, more expensive than they ever have been. Drugs. Drugs um, okay. is what is driving our costs. Uh, so we are, and I, I talk about it, and I won't be redundant later on, but I talk about it in the future slides when we talk in the health insurance fund. Mm -hmm. But we are putting programs in place to try to mitigate some of those costs. Um, they don't. I would, I'd like to say it would be a cost savings for the county, but in reality, what it is is it it tries to stop the bleed yeah. um, there. So we're putting in some additional manufacturer assistance programs. We just had our largest union um, signed with us. It's contractual and required to negotiate programs like that when it changes significant benefits. Um, so what <coughs> that will do is try to seek manufacturer rebates first before the drugs are um, on our plan. Um, and those, it's typically the, what we're kind of earmarking is drugs that are over four, $14,999 a month. Um, and we have we have several of them. Um, the programs through manufacturer assistance program are uh, financial assistance programs that are going to be dependent on the individual's income. And so it's, we're at the mercy of the pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. for their specific criteria. Yeah. Um, and in hopes that the individuals are eligible, then it should reduce our costs. But it's a gamble. Um, but we are putting those programs in place. I already have um, the Smart Start program in place, and uh, for high cost prescriptions, when individuals are put on a medication that they've never been on before. So instead of getting a 30-day supply of a drug that may cost twenty-five thousand dollars, they'll get um, half the supply to see if they tolerate it first. And mm -hmm. if they tolerate it, then they'll they'll get the other half uh, mm -hmm. and fill up the prescription to try to save money there. Uh, and we again continue to look for where next month you'll see a resolution coming forth for elect rx which is an additional international pharmacy where we will try to source some of our other um, prescriptions to find less expensive That's options cool. and um, we already have true north which um, expanded the international pharmacy to include uh, Injectables, which tend to be expensive, and then but are also temperature sensitive. So, also the retirement expenses um, up about six hundred year over year. Um, just curious, how many people do we have in our retirement pool, and how many enter it on average every year? I know it's going to fluctuate. You know, it's a ten this year, but on average, how many people enter the retirement world where where this oh, has an effect on our retired. Mm -hmm. Um, say probably a dozen. All right, and in. then how many are in it? Oh, are in our retirement pool like, that are active and oh, that mm -hmm. are active yeah, employees that are, that are we're yeah. paying. Yeah. Um, Sean, what is he here? Oh, there you are. Hi. Um, I would say in the four hundred. Okay. Every, every full time employee is required to be in yeah. the retirement system. Correct, unless they've already retired. Correct. From yeah, but system. I mean, this is retirement expenses. Correct. We get, yeah. an annual, we get an annual invoice from the New York State Retirement System based on your uh, 
payroll. Okay. And gotcha. Yep. From okay. my speak from speaking with the treasurer, uh, the rates are going to be increasing mm -hmm. with right. um, the retirement system. So next year, uh, 2026, uh, according to the treasurer, we could see significant increases in that line to the tune of perhaps a million dollars. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, any other questions in regards to the A fund? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the 4439. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You requested 140 and that was reduced to 120. Mm -hmm. Is there still room in that line, or? <coughs> in for in miscellaneous supporting services or other service fees? Sorry. Other service fees. Um. I don't believe that there is. These are um, contracts that we have currently between Kronos and UKG. Um, that the Kronos and UKG should turn into a maintenance agreement uh, shortly. It, uh, we're in negotiations in regards to what that maintenance agreement is going to look like. Uh, and also, <coughs> we have to complete phase three of our door project. Uh, the door project right now is through Linstar. We're working on that um, currently. Finishing up at the, well, we're going to be starting and finishing up at the Sheriff's Department in shorthand, but then we move on to phase three, which will include the last buildings um, that are on our old system. So, are those, we, sh we know those, what those numbers are? I know what those numbers are. So, do those numbers total that line? About, approximately, close enough. It's close. I, but what I don't know is what I, is, the maintenance agreement, the 75 pot potential mm -hmm. when Kronos and UKG turns into a maintenance agreement. And that's, and that, that's in that line. I can look at it further, when, but I believe that that money is necessary. Nicole? Yes. How long do you have to be employed in order to be eligible for health insurance? It after, depends you, after you retire? Oh, after you retire. It depends on the bargaining agreement. You have to work for the county. You have to be a full-time employee. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to be vested in the retirement system. Right now, tiers are um, five-year vesting periods. So So that's pretty much for... Yeah, I mean, tier, tier four was always 10 years of vesting period, mm -hmm. but there's no more. There's really, you know, we're tier six. At this point, it's five-year vesting period, and pretty much everybody's gone to that. So technically, somebody could work here for five years um, full-time and then retire with their retired health insurance. Uh, yes. So five years is a minimum, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nicole, on that same thing, so if someone's already has vested, say they work for a different county and they, move, they come to this county, they still would have to work five years? Generally speaking, yes. If we have, it depends on the bargaining agreement. That's a good question. It depends on the bargaining agreement. But I mean, so they'd be vested in the county that they're in. They work mm -hmm. five years in another county, but that doesn't get grandfathered into this county. Good. So they work, they'll have to work yeah. for another five years here. Yeah. Generally speaking, there are, there are some um, negotiations with some bargaining agreements that we need to work on that will change that language. Um, but five years is the, a standard. And it's 20% a year, obviously, they get vested? I'm sorry? Is it, do they get graduated into the vesting? Is it 20% a year? Or is it five years, 100%? It's five years. Yeah, five okay. years. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll go on to the M fund, which is the health insurance. And we pretty much talked about everything when we were talking about the A fund. Um, 
we bill back to the defund, the DM, so we bill back to DPW's funds as well as the sewer district funds um, and the A fund to make up the health insurance lines. Uh, we have, last night, you uh, uh, moved forward a resolution for our stop loss. Our stop loss, because we've hit the stop loss uh, on a few claims, has uh, was projected as a renewal of 85% increase. So our broker did go to market on that, and we, um, we got back um, a 19% and a 30% from Niagara. And the 30% contract, which I put forward last night, uh, uh, increase provides uh, rate caps as well as no lo new lasers on uh, high cost claimants so if we have a high cost claimant next year they're not going to laser that individual which means that you know right now our cap is any individual claim at 350,000 if they reach that 350,000 and a laser could potentially be 600,000 for that person so it promises no new lasers um, so um, other than that, in the health insurance fund, that's those are the those are the changes. Uh, obviously, it's increased, and the A fund primarily feeds this M fund, so you'll see those increases reflect in this budget. This is the holding for all the health insurance. Not that we could do anything about it, but has anyone been lasered in on this year? Not yet. We have in the past had a $600,000 laser, laser for, mm -hmm. and then the workers comp fund, um, I, won't, I won't bore you to death, uh, sorry if you don't mind me just taking a step back for a second, one thing I do want to point out that's not in the budget is um, reimbursements that we receive. Uh, we, uh, as another savings measures, we seek reimbursements through Medicare, through the retiree drug subsidy, um, as well as pharmaceutical rebates uh, through our PBM. And um, since 2018, we've received $1.1 million uh, back in um, uh, pharmacy rebates. And then an additional, um, let's say, $950,000 worth of rebates through Medicare. So we do try to seek uh, additional uh, ways in which we can get reimbursements for some of the programs that, um, drug programs that we have in. And then moving forward to workers' comp. Workers' comp is the same story every single year. Um, our highest loss leaders will always be uh, Montgomery County and the city of Amsterdam and in the professions that we would normally um, see that have the most exposure, um, positions that work outside, DPWs. Um, you know, we work with the, the different um, departments on safety measures and making sure individuals are wearing proper um, clothing uh, when they're doing their positions and that they have the, the proper uh, equipment to do their jobs. Um, certainly more work that we can do in the program, uh, but right now it's, it's, not a, it's not a huge increase from last year, but there is still an increase. We did have some scheduled loss of use and some um, Section 32s, which ends a case. Uh, that was pretty significant this year and um, is reflected in participant assessments uh, that were sent out to all of your um, uh, towns uh, and villages within the plan this year. I do expect that part of it, um, the um, experience of those losses to um, drop for next year. We've had a, a pretty decent year, knock on wood, um, and with no significant losses this year. Any questions? Any questions? Is everyone awake? Wide. <laughs>
What's that? County executive, members of the legislature, legislative clerk, and county attorney. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight about our 2025 budget, something that we take very seriously. A brief overview of the office. Um, the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office consists of the 911 Dispatch Center, Civil Office, Patrol Division, uh, Corrections, Jail Division, which houses 177 inmates potentially, averages 105, 110 right now, our Investigations Division, our Emergency Services Division, and our newly formed EMS Division. Uh, approximately 180 full-time and part-time employees. We handle approximately 30,000 calls for service and make approximately 1,100 arrests per year in our community. The overall budget is $12.3 million. This year, uh, you'll see a, approximate $1.2 million increase in our budget. When you start to break down that increase, $500,000 of it is wages that were awarded by bargaining agreements in the county. Uh, that caused the shift differential and overtime lines to increase because as salaries increase, those two things increase directly. Put in $200,000 for four patrol cars and we put in $90,000 for tasers for our patrol and law enforcement division. So really if you remove those items out of that 1.2 million, uh, we're looking at really an increase of over just $300,000 for medical care, food, gas, contracts. As we all know, everything goes up. Uh, the county executive and treasurer, the changes that they made to our budget, we asked for four patrol cars, they reduced it to two. We asked for four new EMTs and two medics, they removed the four EMTs. Uh, they increased our jail revenue from 850000 to a million. And they removed the $70,000 from the taser purchase uh, to, to vote or to approve a $20,000 five-year lease option to get the equipment, but yet save $70,000 up front. Um, no new positions in our office except for the EMS division. Uh, as it stands right now, there are two new medics in that division. And in regards to our patrol cars, um, we did ask for four. Really need three, have been knocked down to two. Uh, we're doing everything we can to keep our equipment. Both the legislature, county executive's office, and our office have done a phenomenal job catching our equipment up and we try to replace them at $200,000 or two, sorry, 200,000 miles. And, uh, you know, we have some that will be well over that if that doesn't happen this year. So, um, and that information was provided with backup. So I'm open to any discussion or any specific questions or lines that you would like to talk about. Um, you know, I have numbers on our EMS division as far as revenue and number of calls uh, if, if you want to hear that information yes yeah. okay so so far um, since the end of March we have billed nine hundred and thirty thousand four hundred sixty three dollars and thirty five cents for EMS calls and that's to respond to six hundred and fifty nine calls by our ambulance and twenty nine calls from our first responder uh, BLS fly car patrol deputies for a total of six hundred eighty eight so those 688 calls are times in Montgomery County that there is no ambulance at all, or there's a wait of greater than 40 to 45 minutes. So we don't respond unless two, those two things come into play. So you can imagine it is, a, it is a service that's needed. It is a service that the people have supported drastically and they're very appreciative of. Out of that 930,463 that we've built, so far we've collected 161,551.71. Um, we expect more collection. We think we're well behind the curve of when that actually comes in. It takes a long time to process. Uh, this year there was $400,000 budgeted for revenue. May not make that by the end of the year, but I think we'll be close, I really do. And uh, that revenue was not decreased when our staffing levels were decreased back when we did the budget for the first set of ambulance staff. So moving forward, leaving the two medics in, uh, we've put $500,000 revenue for 2025 because we anticipate a second rig full time, which obviously would be responding to more calls, which hopefully means more revenue. So the EMS budget was $533,000 for 2024. You know, if we collect 260,000 in revenue, we've covered half of that budget 
right off the bat and provided a, a quality necessary service to the community. Um, you know, I guess it depends on how you want to look at things. Uh, does the ledge want to have that expenditure? Does the county think it's worth it? Do the people think it's worth it? You know, those types of questions certainly are always in the discussion. Where did you say our revenue is in the EMS? How much we've collected so far? 161, 551, 71. Out of 900 something. Out of 934, 63, 35. Now these numbers are from our billing person today, Sean, so you probably don't have that exact payment yet, but I don't, I don't believe that she would give me fictitious numbers. Sure, are you uh, aware of any other county doing this and what the typical timing is on reimbursement and, and how, how it lags? And There are a bunch of counties doing it and a bunch of counties getting into the EMS business but honestly, I do not know the exact lag. Uh, I know some of the calls are insurance driven. Right. Some of the calls are Medicaid, Medicare, which is delayed from the state always yeah. in a reduced rate. Yeah. Um, you know, accidents are no fault, which are usually fairly quick. I, I think it just depends on the carrier. Uh, I know that when our ambulance responds, we do a PCR, that PCR gets sent to the state and to the billing company. The billing company gets on it right away and sends it to the appropriate information provided on the PCR and then you know it's a waiting game until the payment comes. Do you have people following up on this stuff? We do. We have a, a consultant that's called EMR that, that they do our billing and they're on it. Um, actually Legislator Majewski and I spoke about you know what do we do about that huge gap? Is mm -hmm. it worth trying to collect some of that or not? And I think that's certainly a discussion for a different day or, or a discussion that we have to decide is that what we want to do as a county? Yeah, because I think we just discussed in the beginning we did. whether or not we were going to attempt to recoup yes. payments that were not being paid to us, and we kind of were... Well, the initial thought was it's a brand new service, so let's see how it goes, and... Right. Yeah. How long are you willing to play that game? The service is needed, no question. Your, your numbers evidence that, but I mean... If we're going to bill at nine hundred a year and get paid a buck fifty, uh, that, well, that that's going to be there's got to be a point in time where the bleeding's got to stop. Well, we won't be into it for a full year until the end of March. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I I believe we should run at least like fourteen fifteen months to see what that full year of collection is, mm -hmm. and then compare the numbers and make a decision at that point. I just. Obviously, I take direction from you, when, especially when it comes to things like this. I, I just hate to hit a taxpayer in their pocket for taxes for a service, even though we know it's needed, and then also go after them when their insurance company isn't covering a bill. Yeah. You know, the bill might be for, let's just say, 5000 and the insurance company pays 2500 Well, it's, it's yeah. almost like you have to accept what they're going to pay. This is a double-edged sword. Yeah. You know, I mean, not only is it timing, but... Uh, when you get money, it's not going to be 100% of what you build. We know that, you know. I mean, that's the way the medical business works. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, it's it's trying to figure out the difference between, you know, wh what what we're going to be able to get paid and and uh, ultimately for each service and you know what you're billing and and can we sustain that gap? I'd like you know? to see us play some hardball with the insurance companies and say, you know. Come on, this, these costs are legitimate costs. They're not inflated. Doesn't this company do that for you? They do, but I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, the insurance companies are much more equipped to play that game. Oh, they are. I mean, yes. I believe me, you know, as you know, I'm on a hospital board, yes. and it happens all the time, and people have to attack it, you know, and keep resubmitting and resubmitting, you know, and so it's, this, it's a game. Yeah, this company we have is a billing company, and they certainly are, have our best interest at heart, but they may not be... The ones are the most appropriate to go, you know, to, to really. We can give you Megan. <laughs> <laughs> that will be an extra fifty thousand a year. <laughs> as long as you collect three hundred, that's okay. Is any of it uh, if, you, if you can make eight hundred for you, you because that's what happens in the hospital. Yeah, you know, well, you didn't fill out the right code. We're only going to pay you this much. Okay, you know, somebody didn't process the thing right on the front end. You got to get it back, resubmit it. Is, is 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 this plain as day, ambulance service, or is it how you code it on this? Uh, I honestly do not know the answer, but I will call them and try to get that for you. Um, I mean, just something to look into because that may be 
you know, yeah. I, I, I'm just aware that it's part of the game. So it's a big discrepancy when you look at that number. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. yep. So how much is that company charging us to go after that? They, they get roughly six percent. And then the other question in the appropriation and revenue that says that we, as of September 30th, received fifty-six thousand in that line. Did a huge payment come in in October, or well, is there a lag? If you see in, in Northern Port Watches, there's, there's two lines that we received. The uh, 3625 is in earmarked for the Medicaid reimbursements, and the 1589 would be if you're private paid in, in uh, insurance. I don't have the, the correct printout with me. But those would be the two lines. Those are the two lines? Okay. That you so, see the EMS chart. So when we budgeted the EMS chart check, we just budgeted the 400 in Medicaid in mm -hmm. when they first did the rest okay. this year. Okay. But we corrected it, I corrected it in the 2025 budget okay. because of the, the state aid now is only Medicaid. <laughs> it's a, to be honest with you, it's a travesty too what, what the state pays. No, it's be back for the service that you peanuts. provide. Yeah. Jeff, an emergency service line, you have $80,000 put in for overtime. If you had another employee, would, would that reduce that to a different amount, or is the eighty thousand in the emergency services line? Mm -hmm. Emergency oh, medical EMS. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I would like to say it could be reduced. However, one more employee doesn't make a huge di difference because you you almost need two because you need two in an ambulance. So if you had one, um, it'd be like odd person out for scheduling and. You never know. Uh, you know, the part of the difficulty with the budget for emergency services or law enforcement or EMS is that you don't know what kind of incidents are going to happen. You don't know when they're going to happen. You don't know what equipment's going to break in the jail. You don't know how sick the inmates are going to be that come in. Um, you know, so all those things come into play. So I'd love to say the overtime could be reduced, but I can't guarantee that we wouldn't reach a cost if their shift ends at 10 and a call comes in at no, I, I, I'm just because you were talking about employees, and when you yeah. have eighty thousand dollars for, you know, that's almost two employees for what you're, for yeah. some of them here, yeah. you know, it's. But you still have to have some overtime. Now, you know, could we do better than that? Maybe, yeah. I, I just, I just like to be honest and 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 not give a guarantee because you never know how it's going to play out. You know, sometimes. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough to that you all allow budget transfers. I don't think I've ever come back to the ledge for extra money, but because you allow budget transfers, it helps me survive and get to the end of the year sometimes paying bills for things that come up. Um, you know, I know that's not the ideal way, but it's the honest way. Better than taking out a fund balance. Yeah. You gotta get creative sometime. You know, our jail revenue this year, um, we were bumped up to 1.1 million in for 2024, and I most likely am going to fall shy. I did the math the other day, and I think I'm right around a million. Um, but if you remember, I sat here <laughs> at 850 and said, "Don't do it." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, then the million you got there is appropriate. The the one that the executive hopefully wanted. yes yeah. yes. And I and I came in a little under. Yep. I came in again at 850. Yep. Um, you know, but I'm hopeful that we will make a million dollars this year. It'll be really close. <coughs> and the, and the, if you look at the revenues, I think we're over two million total in revenues. Yeah, two four. You know, another thing that you should know is right now we are processing four point three million dollars in grants. That's zero county money. That four point three million. And thankfully, I know it's still taxpayer money because those grants come from someplace. But thankfully, we're getting the grants. And we're using that money to do things in the county that if we didn't get those, we would be seeking funds from this this body and the taxpayers of this county because some of it is, you know, certainly necessary work and some of it's things to help with services that we provide that you could get away without. However, it improves the quality of service you're providing. And speaking of grants, um, your total revenue from 2023 actual budget is down about a million dollars. Is what? Down about a million dollars. 
And I think that's mostly because of those four or five grants at the bottom of your revenue line. You got the yes. SH, yes. SP grant, three of those. Correct. A, the and, you'll, and sir, you'll see those go up again when we get those SACG grants in early 2025 and we have to do budget adjustments when those grants are accepted. Okay. They just haven't been awarded yet. Um, there's a PSAP grant coming, public safety answering <coughs> grant, and there's an SICG state state off state communications information grant. Yeah, my, yeah. My question was, are we applying for those grants? Oh, yeah. Okay. We apply every time, everything that we possibly can, and some of them are difficult because they dictate what you can spend it on. So there's an on occasion we do not because we just don't need that, right. and it wouldn't benefit us. You mean our actual cost or what we're billing? Our actual cost. Uh, I have would have to look at the paperwork back at the office, but I want to say it was like. Want to talk about it? But I say. Uh, like, can you just shoot me an email with that? I can. <laughs> because the the feds are paying us one hundred twenty dollars yeah. a day. Yes. yes. Thank you. And it's not enough. No, it is. Okay. Jeff, in the budget, you have sixty-two thousand dollars for medical fees. Yes, in the jail, jail part La of the budget. Last yes. night we did a transfer yes. for one hundred forty-one thousand. Yes, a lot of money. We had we've had some very very uh, sick individuals in the facility. Um, we're on the back spectrum of bail reform. I think how it's affected counties and county jails. Um, initially, we weren't getting incarcerated individuals in because they weren't coming in on bail. Well, now they're sentenced, and when they're coming in, we're, they're here for a little while. And we've had a couple that have been in Albany Med, uh, Ellis, St. Mary's for long periods of time, serious medical conditions. We just got one release that was on a monthly $27,000 medication. Oh my God. And it does not take long for that money to add up. How long you know, was he in the jail? He was there for six months. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. So the minute they walk in that facility door, Medicaid, Medicare, everything is out the window and it's our responsibility. Um, so these people like Otis and Andy Griffith, they get they come into prison and, and get a free meal and free drugs that they couldn't get out on the street. So there's a lot well, of things that have changed. They get yeah. three meals a day. Um, you know, if you recall, the Matt uh, Matt um, medication provided uh, assisted treatment in the jail was a new legislation. That's very expensive. They're providing them anybody that's addicted or ever used opioids ever in their life is, is receiving uh, controlled substances now in the facility. Is, can some of the opioid money be used to offset that cost? Sarah does. So any anything that Sarah Branco gets that she can, she pr provides us to help try to offset Good. that cost. Correct. Unbelievable. What a racket. So you, you, we could have a great 2025 and that number could, you know, we could be over budgeted. But it could also be with us. Doing a fine job, Sheriff. Uh, last night you approved a grant for an emergency vehicle, I think. Yes. What's happening to the old vehicle? We took two in the auction. You should have seen two in the auction. Okay. We took two out and are adding one through that. And their mileage was too high to. Oh, yeah, they were. DPW said the frames were time to, <laughs> but they were. If you looked at the years, and I don't, I don't have that memorized, but they were 10 and 11 years old. They had lived their lives, and had been repurposed a couple times also. You know, years past, we've purchased some vehicles out of jail revenue, but this year I, I really can't because I'm not over and above what was budgeted. So that's the sad part for us this year. We got a couple more months. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay. Public defenders.
cost me a fortune. They were talking about the hospitalization. I'm like, just let them go. So I, let me ask if you have any questions for me if, if to start off. If not, I'll speak. Looks so, pretty self-explanatory, Bill. You're yeah. up 130 year over year, and 127 we approved last year. So I mean, the, what else, What more is there to say? The only thing that I'm <clears throat> asking is two things. <laughs> I've made a printout here. Um, if any of you are interested, I made one for each of you. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm asking for two things. I have three full-time public defenders that are working in Amsterdam City Corp. And right now they're making in the 80s. And um, we put in the budget for these three attorneys $103,000. And if you see from the handout that I'm giving you, it was fortuitous. Just last week, there was an article from the New York State Defenders Association. It's an organization in Albany. They've been around for about 40 years. They provide backup for defense attorneys all across the state of New York. And um, they, um, the, top, the lead article in the New York State Defenders Association news picks from last week was about the staffing crisis of public defender's offices across the state. And, you know, I've, I'm fully aware of it. I don't know what is causing it. I don't remember this. I don't know if it was COVID. COVID changed so many things. Um, but I know for the last five years, our office has been doing arraignments. We're never closed. We're open 24 seven. And I can tell you that the, you know, I've done it myself and it's, <laughs> It is very, very difficult to be on call for a week and wait for that phone to ring. I mean, my heart beats right out of my chest when it rings at two o'clock in the morning. And this is so anyway, there's a stress that's, that we never had before because of the on-call arraignments. And uh, so, but the thing is, there is a, a staffing crisis going across the, the state and it's getting more and more difficult to fill positions when somebody's there's a vacancy. It's, and this, these three attorneys are doing a great job. And this is state money. This would not cost the county anything. And I have to say that they're the only attorneys that either, either are, are not now or won't, it will be in January making over $100,000 as a full-time attorney for the county. And I can't, I can't, I can't give them an answer why. Um, I attached to this uh, document that I've handed out, it's the budget for Fulton County for their full-time attorneys for 2024. They've been making over $100,000 for at least two years now, it's my understanding. And I believe they're about to get another raise, okay? I've worked in Fulton County for years. I loved it. I, and Fulton County is like a sister county to us. We're like twin sisters. Their numbers are almost identical to us. I went to law school with their previous public defender who's now with a judge. And, and um, I've known the numbers for years. And so the thing, is, the thing is that I don't know what the other counties are doing. I know Schenectady is in a crisis. I have two printouts from April of 2024 from the Amsterdam Recorder and W10 News, Schenectady County is having a problem. They got lawyers are leaving. In fact, I hired one of them. Um, when I say I, the office, we hired one of them and he was with us for like three or four months and he left. But he's told me, he said, what's going on in Schenectady is unsustainable. I don't know what, 
I don't know what the situation is other than what's been reported in the papers and that they can't keep lawyers, but it's the same thing across the state. And my point is, we have the money to incentivize these guys to stay in the job, and it's state money. It's, they're willing, the money is sitting there, and it won't cost the county anything. And, um, and if, you know, it's the domino effect. I don't ever remember that since all the years I've been practicing, I've been PD now for like 26 years here. And uh, I don't know, I've never felt that kind of like domino effect. Like if one leaves, it's gonna knock the next one and the next one. But um, we have three great guys in city court. I don't wanna belabor the point, so I'm gonna move on. I have one other request, family court. Somehow we got by for the first 25 years with two lawyers in family court, part time. And, you know, um, the thing about family court is that I practiced in family court all these years. There's not often an, an incentive to settle. They argue about. Am I going to get 49% of the time with the children or 51%? And, and, they, and they're willing to go to trial over minor issues. It's difficult to settle. It's not like a criminal case where you're, somebody's facing state prison if they don't reach an agreement. So there's just this, it's, it's very difficult. You talk to anybody who practices in family court, it's, it's stressful. So we have, you gave us a, another third attorney and uh, it was in January, you recall I appeared before you, and greatly appreciate it, and, but <laughs> it was broken, and we really could use another one. The, the, we, like I said, for 25 years we got by with two, and these are part-time lawyers, and I'm asking for another part-time position, um, again, to hopefully keep the ones that we have, and um, so. I guess that's pretty much all I have to say. Do you have any questions? A question. How can we do arraignments 24 hours, seven days a week? Why don't we do them in the morning or one in the evening? And why, why are we doing, was, why are we doing this way? I was saving this to come back in January. This needs to be addressed. We're the only county, and I'm gonna take the responsibility. It's my fault. It's nobody else's fault but my own. But we're the only county that is still doing it that way. Every county around us has gone to morning and evening arraignments. Um, so uh, it's, they call it a centralized arraignment part. And um, I've been talking to the sheriff for months about it. So, and we're close to it. I think we're close to it, setting it up. But um, there's always seemed to be one more hurdle to get over. And, uh, and so, all the counties around us, Schenectady. Uh, what are the hurdles, Bill? Pardon? I mean, what are, what are the hurdles? I mean, you got to keep them in oh, the, you, locked up until you can arraign them, though, right? Well, it, there's just so many moving parts, so many variables. You got to get the town judges to agree. Um, they want to, we're talking about having them on a rotation, but we need to get enough judges to be part of it. They don't want it, they don't want to have so few judges that they're on call like one out of three or four or five weeks, but not everyone wants to do it. The judges want to do the arraignments in their own court with their own equipment, with their own staff. So it's a new thing, um, and it's gonna take some, uh, you know, finessing to get them to want to come around to it, but it really, it really is necessary because I, I'm Can we help? You, pardon? Can we help? Can we make it? Law? To I require centralized arraignment? Pardon? <laughs> I mean, how do the other counties, I mean, there's bigger counties with more moving parts than us that have yeah. achieved it. Well, I can you say, know. I'm going to take the blame for it. I don't well, know. No, the, the, the sheriff looks like he's got something to say. There's three things in our county that really, that really have affected it, and Bill and I have talked numerous times. One is Montgomery County has a law in the books that we're allowed to hold pre arraignment detainees. So the only arraignments that should be happening overnight are ones that require an order of protection or those of very serious nature. Yeah. Rape, robbery, homicide, you know, something that you know, needs to be addressed immediately. 
everything else, they go to the jail, they stay in the jail overnight, and then the patrol officer, whether it be one of the villages, the city, New York State Police, or us, pick them back up in the morning and ran them in the morning. We do it all the time. The second hurdle was Matt Shivers, who's the legal counsel for the magistrates, had met with Matt Allison for when he was the county executive and I and Bill, and originally he said we needed three full-time deputies to handle the centralized arraignment. I said, I don't have three deputies to just handle those arraignments. Now recently he's backed off to two, but again, that's two people twice a day off our schedule to do nothing but these arraignments, and they want the arraignments to be held in the lobby of the sheriff's office, mm -hmm. which, you know, they wanted us to provide a fax, they wanted us to provide an internet, they wanted us to provide a desk and a computer and, and all the space, but that the state doesn't provide anything to benefit you to do this program. And the law on the books kind of has, should be reducing the amount of arraignments that are happening overnight drastically. Now yes, are there arraignments? Yeah, if there's a domestic violence case or something that requires, a, requires an immediate order of protection, the judge gets woke up, he in turn wakes up the ADA and the public defender because the public defender must be present now for every arraignment. Is that an, an accurate paraphrase? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I just wanted to share, that's why a lot of that is happening right now. Now, the public defender shows up how does the contract with the people on call and pay a stipend? What part is that? Well, so we have right now 10 lawyers. They're on call one week out of 10. So whoever is on call has a phone and they get, if there's an arraignment anywhere in the county, anytime they get called. So what we have set up now is that if they appear in court between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m., they get $200 per arraignment. So that is, I'm going to tell you, that is a real, this is, I think it's keeping this thing together, it really is, so. So that is paid to current employees or outside attorneys? These are attorneys who are in the office. Who are in the office. Yeah. And uh, the piece that you handed out from our sister county, are those the only attorneys that the public defender has? I'm sorry, please. So they have six assistant public defenders yeah. in the shoot. Is that a full time? Or is that all the attorneys that have? They, they have, I think, five or six full time and one part time. But they do have a centralized arraignment. Their arraignments are in the morning and the evening, done at the jail. So uh, they're not being called out like we are 24 7. So this makes a big difference. Are there more arraignments uh, in Fulton County than Montgomery County? Or are our is numbers crime are similar. Our numbers are pretty similar. I think. I think that. They, yeah, I would say. Like I said, you know, statistically, they, do. they have about as many arrests as we do. So in the twenty-five budget, you're looking at about sixteen. Attorneys full time and part time? Well, 50. 50. I'm look, well, right. So if you give us one, what would raise us to um, 16? But family court, they would, they would all be part time. They'd be equivalent to maybe two full time. And they're similar in statistics. As you know, I, I can't tell you family court exactly. I, I just know that our courts have exploded in family court. Our, our, our three lawyers now, Indigent Legal Services put up standards and, go, and goals, and our lawyers, are, well, you, if you remember from last January, are well over the standards and goals, and they still are. It was reduced, but they're still well over. Well, I was just trying to use, you gave us something to compare to. Mm -hmm. compared to it and yeah. make it comparable. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do you have more? You sure? Thank you. Thank you. See everybody tomorrow. Same bat time. Same bat channel. <laughs>